This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 46. In this episode, I will tell the history of hiking and running across the Grand Canyon rim to rim. For most ultra runners, this is a bucket list experience. I've run more than 1,000 miles down in the canyon. Wow. Years ago, the canyon wasn't much to see when the Flintstones visited it. Boy, the Grand Canyon. That's one of nature's wonders. Let's take a look. So that's the Grand Canyon, huh? That's it. Well, doesn't look like much to me. Not now, but they expect it to be a big thing someday. Look, Dad, there's water down there. Sure. That's the Colorado River. That's what dug this whole canyon. Well, just think of it. Thousands of years of constantly running water did all that. Wow. No wonder you don't like us leave the water faucets dripping. <laughs> <laughs> now to the story of the Grand Canyon rim-to-rim history. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. For both ultra runners and hikers, the Grand Canyon is considered by most one of the greatest destinations to experience. Thousands make their pilgrimage every year to experience the joy of journeying across the canyon's great expanse, rim to rim. Crossing the Grand Canyon and returning back is an activity that has taken place for more than 125 years. Native Americans crossed the canyon centuries earlier than that. Anyone who descends into the canyon should take some time learning about the history of the trails they use. These episodes will tell the story of many of the early crossings and includes the creation of the trails, bridges, Phantom Ranch, the water pipeline, and the things that you will see along the journey. Run, come see what this river has done. When this history story starts, about 1890, there was no Grand Canyon Village, no Phantom Ranch at the bottom, and the corridor trails did not exist. There were few visitors to either rim because they lacked roads, and there were no automobiles yet. Early miners descended using very rough routes. This episode will concentrate on what is called the corridor region near the Grand Canyon Village, where most of the crossings are taking place. The Bright Angel Trail descends from today's Grand Canyon Village. The upper part of the trail coming down from the south rim was originally a route used by the Havasupai to access what became known as Indian Garden about halfway down the canyon, 3,000 feet below. In 1887, Ralph Cameron, future U.S. Senator of Arizona, prospected and believed he found copper and gold near Indian Garden. He said, At that time, my only purpose in building the trail was to use it in pursuing mining operations. Work began in 1890, and it would take 12 years to complete. In 1891, Peter Berry, longtime friend of Cameron, succeeded in obtaining rights to the trail, including the rights to collect tolls. By the end of that year, after spending $500 and several months of labor, a very rough trail existed that descended the Bright Angel Fault to Indian Garden. Originally, the trail was named the Cameron Trail, but soon the trail was also called Bright Angel Trail. How did the trail get its name? This is a subject of entertaining legend and folklore. One story was told by John Hans, who came to live in the canyon about 1883. He was famous for his stories and yarns about the canyon. He said that a beautiful girl who the men thought looked like an angel came to stay at the canyon and would descend often down the trail. One day, she never came back up, was not seen again, and they called it Bright Angel. The truth is that John Wesley Powell named Bright Angel Creek as a contrast to another creek named Dirty Devil. Efforts in the early 1890s only concentrated on the trail down to the mines at Indian Garden. It wasn't until 1898 that work started below there to the river for tourists. Thankfully, there was no bad accidents during construction. One worker said, 
1,500 feet of the trail known as Devil's Corkscrew had to be blasted out, and this is what I considered the best engineering feat of the work. Traces of the original Devil's Corkscrew can still be seen today if you head east on the Tonto Trail from Indian Garden and look down the next drainage where the old telephone poles descend. Early tourists had to dismount and walk their saddle animals down these harrowing set of switchbacks. To build what is known as Jacob's Ladder, a steep series of switchbacks, workmen had to swing down ropes 100 feet to drill holes in the rock which blasting powder was inserted. Workman James Murray escaped serious injury one day. A large boulder weighing about 9 tons had fallen on the trail and needed to be removed. Holes were drilled and blasts put in for the charge to go off simultaneously. One only went off, but Murray didn't believe it. A fellow worker said, He laughed at my fear and seated himself on the rock, proceeded to roll a cigarette. I called to him to jump, as I was satisfied but one blast had gone off, and for some reason he did so. He was not an instant too soon, for as he left the rock the powder exploded and pieces of the stone flew in all directions. Murray was knocked down and covered with rock, but fortunately he was not badly hurt. The workers had to sleep at times on the steep cliffs using a tarp as a blanket because there was no room for a tent and they would wake up in the morning covered with a foot of snow. The work was so hard and conditions so poor that it was difficult to keep men employed. The first known double crossing hike occurred in 1891. Dan Hogan and Harry Ward went down the rough miners trail, crossed the river and bushwhacked their way up Bright Angel Canyon to the North Rim. They then returned by the same route. It was believed the tourists started using the trail during 1896. One hiker said, The climb out of the canyon is trying ordeal at the best. On foot it is appalling, for a mile an hour is a fair average speed, and unknown muscles are soon stretched to the snapping point. The main motivation at the time to descend into the Grand Canyon was to prospect for precious metals. In 1899, William Hull led a company of prospectors down Bright Angel Trail. He said, We packed our effects, including our boat, on a horse. The boat was made out of canvas about 14 feet long. On getting to the river at the bottom of the steep inner gorge, we put it into shape and two of us embarked. With that frail canvas-covered boat, it took all our nerve and every faculty on a strain to keep afloat and avoid the constant whirlpools and mad countercurrents on every side. More than once, we thought for an instant that our time had come. On reaching the north side of the canyon, they claimed to find a ledge with a vein of copper nearly 100 feet wide, located about 1,000 feet above the river. Later that year, W. Frank Russell lost his life trying to cross the river in a canvas boat in an attempt to prospect the supposed vein. He couldn't swim and was last seen clinging to the capsized boat. His remains were found several years later buried in a sandbar several miles downriver. In 1900, the railroad was completed far enough to bring tourists from Williams, Arizona to the Grand Canyon by rail and stagecoach for $10. A small temporary hotel existed at the head of Bright Angel Trail that could accommodate 35 people. Tourists could descend into the canyon on mules or on horses. One tourist at the time recorded, we reached the canyon about 10 o'clock at night. The porters of the Bright Angel Hotel met the train with lanterns and handcarts. I followed a flickering lantern up the hill to the hotel. I stepped into the hotel sitting room. The walls were covered with Indian blankets and skins of wild animals and decorated with deer horns and pictures of the canyon. I was told that owing to the crowd condition of the hotel, I would have to sleep in a tent. By 1903, traveling down by the river and back in one day either by foot or by horse was possible. Ralph Cameron had bought out Peter Berry's interest for the trail, enabling him to make it into a toll road. Cameron built a two-story hotel with adjoining tent cabins at the trailhead and soon charged a toll of $1 to use the trail, plus fees for drinking water and to use the outhouses at Indian Garden, bringing in about $1,000 per month. In July 1903, two Native Americans from Phoenix came to the canyon and set a speed record running down to the river in only one hour. It was not so easy coming up. 
As more tourists made their way to the inner canyon, deaths occurred. In August 1903, a tourist from Kansas who had hiked alone down to the river didn't make it all the way back up. His body was found on the trail about a mile below the rim, and his death was believed to be caused by heat exhaustion. In 1905, description of traveling down Bright Angel Trail to the Colorado River and back was provided by a lady who went by horseback to Indian Garden, then by foot to the river and back. She wrote, A strong person accustomed to walking can easily make the round trip on foot, but women rarely undertake it. The trip from the rim to the river is a trip of six or more hours. At Jacob's Ladder, which is a flight of steps cut into stone, we dismounted, leading the animals down. In three hours, we made Indian Garden. A little camp is situated for the accommodation of the travelers, consisting of a good-sized dining room and several tent houses furnished with Navajo rugs and with white cots. Resting a few moments, we started onward to the river. This portion of the trail is much steeper and difficult. In places, one scrambles and slides down an almost perpendicular wall, the animals being abandoned at a zigzag place called the Devil's Corkscrew. The Colorado River was something of a disappointment to me. I hoped to see a specimen of the raging fierceness of its rapids or waterfalls. Here, instead, it is as turbid as a sea of frothy mud and uninteresting. The trail ended at that point at the mouth of Pipe Creek. There was no river trail yet cut into the cliffs. Returning to Indian Garden, they had a fine dinner furnished us by Japanese cooks and waiters, and then went by horse back up to the rim. It was by 1903 that Ralph Cameron established a camp for tourists at Indian Garden. He first had seven tent cabins, provided meals, and had a phone line to the south rim. Within the next few years, he planted cottonwood trees, dammed the creek to irrigate a garden, and constructed several buildings. By 1917, Cameron was no longer maintaining Indian Garden. It was described as being filthy and disgraceful. By the early 1920s, Garden Creek was seriously polluted and trash littered the area. The National Park had not yet assumed control of the area and it would continue to be a dump for several more years. In 1897, two men ventured across the river and explored up Bright Angel Canyon and discovered Roaring Springs. They discovered a big waterfall. The water seemed to pour out of a cave from a perpendicular side of a high wall of red rocks, and judging from the distance, it was thought it must be fully 50 feet wide. In 1900, John Fuller, a young herdsman who lived seasonally on the North Rim, descended down Bright Angel Canyon at the request of a woman who had lost her husband trying to run the Colorado River in a boat. Fuller agreed to search for his remains. He had great difficulty descending and two horses fell over a cliff and died. Fuller finally reached the future site of Phantom Ranch near the Colorado River. There, he found a deserted camp and a lone burrow. Apparently, another company, intending to return, had also perished in the Colorado River. The tame burrow that became named Brighty would go on to live wild in the canyon for two decades, climbing up to the North Rim in the summer and going back down in the fall. In 1902, D. Woolley, the Mormon leader in Kanab, Utah, started to pursue a vision to allow travel across the Grand Canyon. To descend into the canyon from the North Rim, he chose to try a route down from the head of Bright Angel Creek that Fuller had used, about five miles northeast of the current North Kaibab Trailhead. He and two others explored. There was no trail being used by humans there. They found some game trails that helped them descend to the creek bottoms and concluded that a trail could be made. Later in 1902, a group of surveyors led by Godfrey Sykes descended the same route to consider building a facility to generate electricity. They cleared brush, logs, and boulders. Once down to the wider valley, they continued to follow the boulder-filled Bright Angel Creek to the Colorado River, crossing the creek 94 times along the way and mapping the route. Also in 1902, a separate survey of the Bright Angel Canyon took place by the U.S. Geographical Survey. The team reached the top of Bright Angel Canyon and were surprised to see two men coming up out with a burrow. They had crossed the canyon rim to rim and planned to return. The survey team commented, So steep was it in certain places that the animals fairly slid down on their haunches. By noon they made it down to the junction with Roaring Springs Canyon. 
They crossed Bright Angel Creek 94 times and made their camp for the night prior to entering the box. It rained that night and the next day they looked back up to the north rim and saw that snow had fallen. They spent several days in Bright Angel Canyon mapping it out and then went to the Colorado River where a prospector kindly let them use his boat to cross and head up to the south rim. D. Woolley formed the Grand Canyon Transportation Company in 1903. Work started in 1903 hacking out some rocks and vegetation. The rough trail from the north rim zigzagged down a steep ridge two miles to the creek bottoms. The entire trail soon was also called Bright Angel Trail, the same name used for the trail on the south side of the Colorado River. Woolley's vision was to connect the south side's Bright Angel Trail to the north side's Bright Angel Trail, resulting in one Bright Angel Trail to be used to travel from rim to rim. Today, the upper section of this trail is known as the Old Bright Angel Trail. It is an unmaintained trail and still can be hiked by skilled hikers from the north rim to the bridge below the Manzanita Rest Area. In 1905, Woolley received rights to establish a camp located near the mouth of Bright Angel Creek that was located about a half a mile closer to the river than present-day Phantom Ranch. Woolley's hope was that it could become a tourist camp. Willie's son-in-law, Dave Rust, joined the company in 1906 and went down into the canyon to work as the manager and foreman with those who were building the trail. Day after day, they chipped out a graded trail with pickaxes on the steep side hills. By the end of the year, there was a suitable trail in place from the north rim to the Colorado River, and the workers celebrated by taking a plunge in the river. The nearby camp became known as Rust Camp. Rust and his crew improved the camp with irrigation ditches and then planted cottonwood trees by transplanting branches cut from trees found up nearby Phantom Creek. Some adventuresome people would cross the river in a crude canvas or wooden boat, visit Rust Camp, and then venture up Bright Angel Creek on the north side for a ways. In 1905, a large hunting party, including some of the city's leaders from Williams, Arizona, crossed over to the north rim to hunt. Their company include 14 riding and pack animals, which were all swum across the river. The boat was rowed across 57 times to bring everything across. The trail up the north rim was in poor shape from the storms, so men at Rust Camp were sent ahead to make improvements. Hip boots were worn because of all the Bright Angel Creek crossings that were necessary. The water was a rushing torrent in places and made travel difficult. The trip was cut short on account of a snowstorm. The company killed seven deer. To get more tourists to the camp, in 1907, Woolley and Russ constructed a cable tram system across the Colorado River, allowing visits from the south rim. The cable tram was about 400 feet long and only about 40 feet above the water. It was located near the present-day Black Bridge. All the materials were brought on wagons to the north rim from Utah. Then they were brought down the very rough North Bright Angel Trail. The long cable made heavy loads for several horses, a proportionate coil being backed on the first horse and the wire continued to the second horse which carried a similar proportion of the wire and so forth. The tram with passengers was moved over to the north side by gravity and using a crank. If the car was on the wrong side, an operator would go over on a narrow seat with one pulley to retrieve the car. One early tourist described riding in the cage on a windy day as being the clapper in a bell. The cable tram was a key attraction in the canyon, but there was not always an operator station there. Most visitors weren't daring enough to operate it themselves, so instead of visiting Rust Camp, they would return to the South Rim. By 1908, Rust Camp had six tourist tents, a cook tent, and a herd of sheep. The following year, Russ ran into famous naturalists John Muir and John Burroughs coming down the South Bright Angel Trail and invited them to visit the camp. Rust wrote, They were real people. We would sit down every hundred yards chatting and observing. Russ stayed busy shuttling visitors from Russ Camp to the North Rim and back. It was the first year that the camp was open all season and hosted a few groups of prospectors, hunters, and tourists each week. One of the very early Grand Canyon runs took place in 1910. 
A rich woman was with a group on an outing on the north side of the canyon. An important telegram needed to be delivered to her. During the heat of July, a young man working at the Cold Brothers Photography volunteered to deliver it. The woman's traveling group had a two-day head start on him, but he ran down into the 100-degree canyon, crossed the river in the cable tram, forded Bright Angel Creek repeatedly, and reached the company somewhere up the canyon in only about six and a half hours. In 1913, former President Theodore Roosevelt and his sons visited Rust Camp, coming over in the cable car, and was thrilled to be in the inner canyon. Roosevelt made his first trip to the Grand Canyon in 1903, and was immediately struck by the expansive scene, a place that embodied all the great features of the American West. The crossing over the river took place during a terrible thunderstorm, and all in the party were terribly drenched. Soon after, they reached Rust Camp, which was unoccupied. Rust was away at the time. Guided by two cattlemen, Roosevelt went on up with a hunting party to the North Rim to hunt mountain lions for several days. Hundreds of the lions roamed the rim at that time, along with an estimated 15,000 mule deer. Because of the visit, and because Roosevelt had established Grand Canyon National Monument in 1908, Rust Camp was renamed to Roosevelt Camp. In 1916, Woolley's permit for Roosevelt Camp was revoked, and Russ went to work at Zion Canyon to guide tourists. By 1917, the North Rim was not being maintained, and the cable tram was abandoned. One traveler said the Bright Angel Trail going up the South Rim was a boulevard in comparison to the north side of the trail. He saw the remains of the old cable cage rested on the ledge where it had been left stranded, broken, and useless. Crossings were again accomplished with canvas boats into the 1920s. In 1919, the Grand Canyon National Park was established. That year, a primitive camp was built on the North Rim near the present-day lodge. It was called the Wiley Way Camp, which attracted automobile tourists in their Model T Fords. Sleeping accommodations were wooden floored cabins with a canvas roof. The camp eventually served 120 daily guests. The National Park Service built the first bridge to the canyon across the Colorado River in 1921. It was called the Swinging Suspension Bridge and was built near the present-day Blackbridge. Because the wooden bridge would swing, it could only handle one mule at a time and was only 13 feet above the highest recorded water level. A 1,200-pound cable needed to be brought down the Bright Angel Trail by mules. The cable was successfully brought down on eight mules roped together. The strange parade with the gleaming sinuous snake-like freight started on its way at the break of dawn and reached the bottom of the abyss after dark, having been on the trail over 17 hours continuously. Once the bridge was finally completed, the Park Service reported, The bridge has linked the two sides of the Grand Canyon and makes possible trans-canyon travel. One canyon traveler wrote, our guide told us that he had just come over the bridge from a hunting trip on the North Rim. He said the best time to cross the bridge was early morning or evening, that at noon the wind was too strong. He described how he had come over there at noon and had waited almost an hour for the bridge to become quiet enough for his horse to start over. Just as they got to the middle, a gust of wind raised the bridge floor 12 to 15 feet and slapped it down again with a jolt, and that nearly finished both the guide and the horse. Another reported their journey across the bridge. One of the horses refused to step on the bridge, which swayed too much to suit his fancy and laid down. They had to drag him on. The rough trail up the north rim was still a problem. The trail is very dangerous, one part being six miles long and taking four hours to traverse in a box canyon scarcely five feet in width and through which runs three foot water at a steep grade. But canyon crossing hikes were now possible on foot the entire way. In 1921, Milo D. Gibson went from the north to the south in four days. It took him three days to reach Roosevelt Camp. He described going down the trail. In order to follow it, the creek has to be forded again and again, the depth ranging from knee-deep to waist-high. The manager of El Tavar Hotel on the South Rim explained why there were still few crossings. 
The reason is that the trail up Bright Angel Creek is too difficult. It is too much to attempt except by a seasoned athlete who has no objection to strenuously roughing it. In 1921, Bonnie Gray, a very accomplished athlete and famous stunt rider from California, claimed that she had run across the canyon using the Bright Angel trails in 6 hours 25 minutes. She believes that this feat will never be equaled by a woman. Given the rugged nature of the trail and all the creek crossings needed at that time, the published time should not be believed. <laughs> Roosevelt Camp was renamed to Phantom Ranch by Mary Jane Coulter. Major construction at the ranch began initiated by the Fred Harvey Company in 1921 under Coulter's direction. It opened next year with four cabins, a lodge with a kitchen, and a dining hall. The ranch was designed to be self-sufficient with an orchard of peach, plum, and apricot trees. Also included was a chicken shed and yard and a blacksmith shop. The cabins had two beds, a fireplace, baths, running water, and eventually telephones and electricity. A guest in 1924 wrote, At Phantom Ranch, we found three sleeping cabins with four beds each, a larger central building with the kitchen and a dining room, a garden which was just started, a barn and a chicken house. Green grass is all about, and many small trees that have just been set out. Small boulders had been piled in rows, making most of the fences. Two years ago, it was just a desert. A 1922 dinner bell still hangs east of the dining hall. Without control of the Bright Angel Trail and the continuous tolls, the National Park Service moved ahead with plans to construct a new trail for tourists to use for free. Work began in December 1924 on a new trail coming down the South Rim at Yaki Point as an alternative to the Bright Angel Toll Trail. This new trail was first named Yaki Trail or Yaki Point Trail and eventually would be named Kaibab Trail. Construction of the Kaibab Trail used modern construction equipment that was used to make automobile roads at the time such as compressors and jackhammers. Stray drill bits may still be found along with traces of old drill holes in the rock faces. The trail route was chosen to get sun nearly year-round minimizing snow. The average grade was 18%. After only six months, in June 1925, the South Kaibab Trail was finished at a cost of $73,000. Promotions for the trail included, The new trail will be by far the most scenic trail in the canyon as it winds its way down the walls along a ridge jutting out into the abyss from which magnificent views of the canyon may be had both to the east and to the west. Tourist traffic increased to Phantom Ranch. Two-day mule trips across the canyon were taking place using the South Kaibab Trail and the Bright Angel Trail going up to the North Rim. In 1924, work started on the North Kaibab Trail that would bypass the rough old Bright Angel Trail and head up Roaring Springs Canyon to the North Rim. When it was proposed, engineers said it can't be done, but the trail work was started. Work was mainly performed on the trail during the winter because of the extreme heat. Work required much blasting and hammering, including creating the 20-foot-long Supai Tunnel. In 1927, a cable conveyor system was put in from the North Rim to Roaring Springs to more quickly bring down equipment for the trail building. The trail was literally hewn from solid rock in half-tunnel sections using high explosives, portable grills, and jackhammers. More work was conducted on the trail along Bright Angel Creek, reducing the number of crossings to six. In 1928, the trail was finally completed for $126,000. Both the North Rim Lodge and the trail were dedicated in September 1928. A large delegation came from Utah and California for the trail opening. The Mormon Bishop of Kanab, Utah broke a bottle of ginger ale on a rock at the foot of an aspen tree, formally opening the trail. The guests marched from the trailhead down the trail singing, There's a long, long trail. There's a long, long trail a-winding into the land of my dreams. Travel over the new trail will be much easier, especially for those unaccustomed to the saddle, inasmuch as the trail has easy grades. The North Kaibab Trail was exposed to yearly spring runoff and landslides.
For several years, the Park Service employed a full-time trail worker to oversee trail maintenance. Even today, many seasonal workers maintain the trail each spring in April. Stay tuned for part two covering the bridges, more trails, the water system, the family that lived near Roaring Springs, and the rim to rim races. Mm -hmm. Run, come see what this river has done. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. Mm -hmm.